Today I'm at the Mitchell Monument outside of Bly, Oregon in the southern part of the state. And behind me is a memorial to six people killed, the only six people killed from enemy action on the continental United States. Now the war in the Pacific was mostly focused around the island hopping campaign. And despite the fact that Japan had a lot of creative ideas as to how to attack mainland United States, very few actually came to fruition. With one notable exception being the Aleutian Islands campaign, where Japanese forces invaded United States territory, Alaska not being a state at the time, and island hopped their way along the Aleutian Island chain, in some cases taking prisoners of Native Americans that lived on the islands. The first one I'm going to talk about resulted in deaths, in this case, the six individuals out for a picnic. The Japanese believed it was possible to send balloons to North America using the jet stream, a fast-moving air current at about 30,000 feet above sea level. The balloon bombs, known as fugos, were the world's first intercontinental weapons. It was hoped that by igniting fires, resources would be directed away from the war effort and incite panic across the continental United States. With most of its men busy fighting, Japan turned to its young women to build the balloons. Tanaka Tetsuko, one of the hundreds of high school girls conscripted for the war effort, recalled being told she was helping to make a secret weapon that would help Japan fight the United States. The girls were sent to production facilities around the country where they worked 12-hour shifts with few breaks, little to eat, and slept in unheated dormitories. They crafted the balloons from mulberry pulp, which made lightweight yet strong paper. When it was coated with potato paste, the paper was durable enough for the flight across the Pacific. The first Fugo was launched on November 3, 1944, and over the next six months, Japan sent 9,300 balloons across the ocean, about 300 of which landed or were spotted across North America. Worried that Japan might use the balloons for biological warfare, the U.S. government ordered the press to keep it quiet. To ensure they did not drift higher than the top of the jet stream, the balloons were equipped with pressure release valves that allowed gas to escape when the Fugo reached a certain altitude. During the cool nights, when the balloon sank, it released two of the 32 sandbags it used for ballast. By the time the Fugo reached the west coast, it would be out of ballast and ready to drop incendiary and anti-personnel bombs. The balloons measured about 33 feet in diameter and were filled with 19,000 cubic feet of hydrogen. They were capable of lifting about 1,000 pounds. On May 5, 1945, Archie Mitchell, the new pastor of the Christian and Missionary Alliance Church in Bly, Oregon, took his pregnant wife Elsie and five Sunday school students on a picnic on Gearhart Mountain. Reverend Mitchell parked the car while his wife and the children headed for the bank of Leonard Creek. He heard his wife call out that they had found something, but before he could reach the group, the object, a downed balloon bomb, exploded. Shrapnel ripped across the forest, killing 26-year-old Elsie Mitchell and her unborn child and the five students. The pastor was uninjured except for burns on his hands from trying to quench the flames of his wife's clothing. Richard Jumbo Barnhouse was operating a U.S. Forest Service grader when the carload of picnickers arrived. He heard the explosion and alerted Bly District Ranger Spike Armstrong and timber manager John Jack Smith to the tragedy that morning. Armstrong and Smith arrived with sheets, blankets, and first aid supplies, unsure of what they would find. Smith checked for pulses but found none. While the public was largely unaware of the threat, the Forest Service had been alerted to the fact that the Japanese were sending balloons to the west coast. Smith stayed with the bodies until military personnel could reach Bly, and when the army arrived, the men dismantled four more explosives. When family members in the community were told what happened, they were instructed to keep quiet so as not to hinder the war effort. Newspaper articles about the tragedy cited an explosion of undetermined nature as the cause of death. The silence had its intended effect. Japan didn't hear about the deaths, and seeing little evidence of the Fugo's effectiveness deemed the project a failure. The country stopped launching balloons in April of 1945. The six people killed were the only deaths resulting from enemy action on the American mainland during World War II, earning the event a place in history. The other creative way that the Japanese found to attack the United States was to use long-range submarines in order to launch a float plane and use incendiary bombs dropped on coastal towns in what is known as the Lookout Air Raids. That story focused around the pilot Nobuo Fujita. Nobuo Fujita was a Japanese naval aviator and warrant flying officer for the Japanese Navy who flew a float plane from a long-range submarine aircraft carrier known as I-25 and conducted the Lookout Air Raids in southern Oregon on September 9, 1942, making him the only Axis pilot during World War II to 
to aerial bomb the continental United States. Using incendiary bombs, his mission was to start massive forest fires in the Pacific Northwest near the city of Brookings, Oregon, with the objective of drawing the U.S. military's resources away from the Pacific Theater, the same strategy used in the Japanese fire balloon campaign. Now, Fujita joined the Imperial Japanese Navy in 1932 and became a pilot in 1933. He was on board the I-25 during the attack on Pearl Harbor, where the I-25 and three other submarines patrolled a line of 120 miles north of Oahu. Fujita's plane, a Yokosuka E-14Y Glenn seaplane, did not function properly and he was unable to participate in the reconnaissance mission planned before the attack. After Pearl Harbor, I-25 patrolled along the west coast of the United States along with eight other submarines. They attacked U.S. shipping before returning to their base in the Marshall Islands, arriving there on January 11, 1942 in order to be refueled. The submarine's next mission was to travel through Australian harbors of Sydney, Melbourne, and Hobart, followed by the New Zealand harbors of Wellington and Auckland. On February 17, 1942, Fujita took off in the Glen for a reconnaissance flight over Sydney Harbor in order to examine the city's airbase, and by 7.30 in the morning, he had returned disassembled the airplane and stowed it in the watertight hangar. Fujita conducted several other missions just like this over different ports in Australia and New Zealand. On May 28th of 1942, Fujita performed a reconnaissance of Kodiak, Alaska in preparation for the invasion of the Aleutian Islands. And on June 21st, the submarine shelled the U.S. base of Fort Stevens near Astoria, Oregon. Fujita was on deck of I-25 during the attack. The idea of bombing military targets from a submarine-based seaplane was Fujita's idea, and this included attacking ships at sea as well as on the U.S. mainland, especially in the area of the Panama Canal. The idea was approved, and the mission was given to the submarine I-25. Submarine aircraft carriers, including the I-400-class submarine, would be developed specifically to bomb the Panama Canal. On September 9th, at 6 in the morning, I-25 surfaced west of the Oregon-California border, where she launched the Glen, flown by Fujita with Petty Officer Okuda Shoji on board, and carrying 340-pound load of two incendiary bombs. Fujita dropped the two bombs, one on the Wheeler Ridge on Mount Emily in Oregon. The location of the other bomb is unknown. The Wheeler Ridge bomb started a small fire about 10 miles east of Brookings, which U.S. Forest Service employees were able to extinguish. Due to the fact that it had rained the night prior, the bombs were rendered essentially ineffective due to the damp forest. The plane had been seen and heard by many people, especially when Fujita flew over Brookings in both directions. And about noon on the same day, Howard Gardner at the Mount Emily lookout reported seeing smoke. The four U.S. service forest members discovered the fire caused by the Japanese bomb, and approximately 60 pounds of fragments, including the nose of the bomb, were turned over to the United States Army. After the bombing, I-25 came under attack by the United States Army Air Force aircraft on patrol, forcing the submarine to dive and hide on the ocean floor off Port Orford. The attacks on the sub only caused minor damage, and Fujita flew a second bombing sortie three weeks later, on September 29th. After 90 minutes of flying, he dropped his bombs and reported seeing flames, but the bombing remained unnoticed in the United States. The submarine torpedoed and sank two ships before sailing for its base, and on its way, it sank a Soviet submarine in transit to Dutch Harbor, Alaska, and then San Francisco, California, mistaking it for an American submarine. At the time, Japan and the Soviet Union were not at war. After his missions, Fujita continued as an Imperial Japanese Navy pilot, mostly in reconnaissance duties until 1944, when he was transferred to train kamikaze pilots. He survived the war, opening a hardware store and later a company that made wire. The town of Brookings invited Fujita for a visit in 1962, and after the Japanese government assured he was not going to be tried as a war criminal, he agreed to go. He gave the city of Brookings his family's 400-year-old katana out of friendship, saying that he was ashamed of his actions during the war, and that he intended to use the sword to commit seppuku if he were given a hostile reception. And although his visit raised some controversy, the town treated him with respect. He again returned to Brookings in 1990, 1992, and 1995, planting a tree at the bomb site as a gesture of peace. And in 1995, he moved the samurai sword from the Brookings City Hall into the new library's display case, helping to gather money to build the library. He was made an honorary citizen of Brookings several days before his death on September 30, 1997, at the age of 85. And in October of 1998, his daughter buried some of Fujita's ashes at the bomb site. Thanks for watching, and as always, until next time, get lost.